Last passage in the read-in section, let's read the blurb. It says, this passage is adapted from Thomas W. Schoner and David A. Spiller, Trophic Cascades on Islands, written in 2010. Trophic cascades are basically ecological imbalances. In other words, if you change the population of one species or one animal, it's going to affect a lot of other populations. Some are going to go up, some are going to go down. Uh, basically, it, under it underscores the fact that in an ecological system, there's balance. Now, if you didn't know that, that's okay, because they're going to end up explaining what's going on anyway. So looking at the passage itself, we're going to have to keep in mind the time, because they're going to end up talking about a lot of different studies. The first thing they talk about is in the 1970s, they were looking at vertebrates and the goal of the original study was in line four. Key objective was to determine the threshold island area on which vertebrate populations could just survive. So the threshold is sort of like the point at which something changes. So what they're really saying here is they're probably looking for the smallest island in terms of area size on which a vertebrate can survive. In other words, if the island is too small, you're not going to be able to have a vertebrate population. And one thing that surprised them, it says that in line six, we were astonished to find lizards, particularly this species, on some tiny islands, a discovery that multiplied by at least two orders of magnitude the list of Bahamian islands surmised are known to have resident populations of vertebrates. So all that's saying is that the fact that this guy was on tiny islands, it basically increased the number of islands that also they thought could support that type of species by two orders of magnitude. And that's a lot. An order of magnitude is basically adding another zero onto a number. So the difference between 10 to 100 is one order of magnitude. So as they say, we realized we had to check many quite small islands. Obviously, that makes sense. And then that led to a second, more exciting discovery in line 15. Such islands, these really small ones, sometimes had extraordinarily high densities of spiders. So those are the two things that they realized in the first paragraph. Keep in mind that was in the 1970s, and now we're going to move to 1981. It says, the first study that was in 1981 found that spiders were about an order of magnitude denser on the no lizard than the lizard islands. So that kind of makes sense because presumably lizards are going to eat spiders. So if there are no lizards, then they're going to be a greater number of spiders. Second observational study, this is in 1982, examined the number of spider species, finding that no lizard islands had 1.5 to two times the number of species as had lizard islands. So again, not as great of a difference as an order of magnitude, which would be about 10 times, but still significant that they're mentioning it. And then in line 34, they're comparing these two results, 1981 to 1982, from Payne, he must have been a famous guy or girl, in 1966. And what did Payne find? Diversity increased with increasing predation. So what that basically means is that the greater number of lizards meant the greater number of spiders because lizards prey on spiders. In the next paragraph, they're basically going to kind of sum up their results from the 1981 and 1982 studies. They say, such comparative data point to a strong negative effect of lizards on spiders, meaning to say as the population of one goes up, the other goes down. But as is true of all comparative studies, now they're going to talk about a limitation. The observations did not suffice to eliminate alternative hypotheses about why islands with and without lizards differ. A more reliable investigation would be experimental because the idea is that if you're using you know a proper experiment you're going to eliminate all other variables confounding factors and you should be able to get a clearer reason as to why one goes up the other goes down because right now keep in mind all we have is correlation we're not exactly sure what the cause is so from this point in the passage they're going to describe their experiment and this part gets somewhat confusing so it pays to just read very carefully and take notes as to what they're saying line 45 we staked out nine approximately 83 square meter plots on staniel clay in 1985 three of these plots were unenclosed so the first group i'm going to write unenclosed three of the enclosed plots were randomly chosen to maintain lizards at natural densities so the second group of three 
this is enclosed, had lizards at natural density, whereas the other three had lizards removed. So keep in mind the third set is also enclosed, but we had no lizards. So these are basically their nine plots. Three are unenclosed, three are enclosed with lizards at natural density, and three are enclosed with no lizards. So they sum up in line 53. Thus, we had three treatments. The two types of enclosed plots tested lizard effect. That's these two up here. And the unenclosed plots were a cage control to be compared with the enclosed lizard plots. Now, what were the results? Line 56. The 18-month experiment showed that lizard removal enclosures this was number three, here's the important part, had spider densities three times higher than those control enclosures and the unenclosed. Uh, I, I think there's a little bit of confusion between which ones he's talking about in this sentence, but the important thing is the lizard removal enclosures, which is what I designated by number three, had three times the number of spiders. And that you'll actually see is backed up by the graph when we get to it, so that's the important thing. And then some more details, line 60, numbers of spider species were higher without lizards as well, so there's more variety. Numbers and biomasses of insects caught in the sticky traps were also higher in the lizard removal enclosures. And what does that mean? They're saying line 63, therefore an increase in spiders did not completely compensate for the absence of lizards. My best interpretation of this is that it seems like insects are eaten by both spiders and lizards. That would be my guess. And initially you might think, oh, take away lizards, we get more spiders. But what would happen to the number of insects? Well, more spiders would probably mean less or the same number of insects. But the results were that the biomasses and numbers of insects were higher when the lizards were removed. So when they say an increase in spiders did not compensate for the absence of lizards, I think what they mean is that the greater number of spiders, they were not eating as many insects as the lizards were, so they weren't compensating for them. That would be my guess, my best guess as to the interpretation. Then that leads to the question, line 69, what was the mechanism of the now firmly established lizard effect on spiders? You know, the firmly established lizard effect was hey, you take away lizards, you get more spiders. Line 70, the obvious one is predation, i.e. that lizards eat spiders. So obviously when lizards go up, spiders go down. When lizards go down, spiders go up. However, a second is competition for food. And that's exactly what I was saying from before, that it seems like they're both eating insects, regardless of the insect size. And so that might be a second mechanism for why when lizards decrease, spiders increase, because there's less competition for food. So one is predation, they eat each other. Two is competition for food. If you want to annotate this passage, like I said, keep in mind the times for all of these. In the first paragraph, we're going to notice that their first objective was to determine the threshold area on which vertebrates populations could survive. So I'm going to just write threshold for vertebrates. And they made two discoveries. One discovery was that the vertebrates can actually live on small islands. So I'm just going to say they live on small islands. The second discovery was that, hey, there are a lot of spiders and that's gonna lead them to their next studies and the experiment. In the next paragraph, we're talking about their two studies in 1981. The result of the first study was that spiders were an order of magnitude denser on the no lizard than lizard islands. So basically what they're saying is spiders and lizards are inversely proportional. When one goes up, the other goes down. I'm just gonna use math notation to note that. Spiders inversely proportional to lizards. Second result in 1982 was the same, though not as great of a difference. And then they do the comparison to pain studies in which he said diversity increased with increasing predation. That would imply that pain originally said spiders are proportional to the number of lizards. In other words, the number of lizards go up the number of spiders go up also. And then when they reflect on the 1981 and 1982 data, they're talking about what are the limitations and what are the other causes. 
So in this paragraph, they're going to talk about the actual experiment. And keep in mind, we've already listed out the three types of plots, so we don't need to do that again. Let's just jump down to the results. The results are listed right in lines 57. So we can write results. And the results specifically was that spiders and lizards are inversely proportional, like they originally said. So we'll just write the same thing again. They also found that the number of insects were higher when there were no lizards. So insects as well as lizards also have an inverse relationship. When lizards go down, insects go up. And then in the last paragraph, they're talking about possible explanations for their results. One explanation is predation. In other words, lizards eat spiders. Another explanation is competition. Question 42, as used in line 11, check most likely means. So let's go back to it, pick our own word. We can start on line 11. We realized we had to check many quite small islands to determine such thresholds. We can stop there. So what's going on, if you remember, the objective in line 4 was to determine the threshold island area on which vertebrate populations could survive. That means they were trying to figure out what is the smallest island in terms of size that can hold vertebrate populations. One thing that they discovered was lizards on tiny islands, which had the result of multiplying by at least two orders of magnitude the list of islands that were known to have populations of vertebrates. So basically, they realized that these really small islands also had vertebrates, so they had to adjust their numbers. And basically, in this sentence, when they say we had to check many quite small islands, you can pretty much guess that means they had to go investigate, or they had to look at, or they had to verify or confirm. So those are going to be my guess words. I'll say verify or confirm, you know, like when you're checking up on someone. Now, because check is such a common word, it's going to have a lot of usages, and that's really what they're taking advantage of here in the answer choices. Counter, now check can mean to counter, which means to sort of like control. In other words, you can check someone's progress by defying them. Clearly, that's not very close to verify or confirm, so we'll cross it off. Choice B, check can also mean to stop in certain cases. Like if you have an impulse to do something, you can check your impulse. In other words, stop yourself from doing it. Also not very close to verify or confirm. Choice C, mark. I actually had to look this up. You can actually use check in the sense of marking something and specifically means that you're marking something into squares like you're checking a piece of cloth this is a very uncommon usage if you're just looking at this by taking the sat you should be thinking to yourself mark has absolutely nothing to do with verify or confirm and that leaves inspect and inspect is actually very close to verify or confirm because they basically had to go and look at the islands they had to inspect them to see which ones actually had vertebrate populations Question 43, the parenthetical statements in lines 25 to 27 and lines 30 to 33 primarily serve two. So let's look at it before we look at the answers. I would start in line 23 right over here. It says, our first study found that spiders were about an order of magnitude denser on the no lizard than the lizard islands. And then it says, adjusted for the positive and negative correlations with area and distance from a large land masses respectively. So your keyword here is adjusted. In other words, this is typical statistical language. The study found that there were more spiders when there were no lizards. So that might automatically make you think that the reason that there were more spiders was because there were no lizards. But if you know, one of the golden rules in statistics is correlation does not equal causation. So it's not necessarily true that there were more spiders because there were no lizards on these islands. There could have been other factors. So when they're saying that they adjusted for these other factors, in other words, the uh, area and distance from large land masses, they're telling you, hey, we took into consideration that these other things could be factors and we adjusted for them and we still found that this relationship was true. So ultimately by taking into consideration other factors, you're making your results stronger. So let's look at the second one. And this is the second study. We can start in line 27. A second observational study in 1982 examined the numbers of spider species, finding that no lizard islands had about 1.5 to two times the number of species as had lizard islands. So the same relationship that we saw in the first one. 
And in the parentheses here, it says, again, adjusted for area and distance, which is what they did before, and for the maximum height attained by the vegetation on the island, which correlated positively with the number of spider species. So in other words, what they're identifying is that the higher the vegetation height on an island, that meant the more spider species. So that could be a distractor, but they're saying that they adjusted for those variations. And after making the adjustments, they found that this relationship of the spiders being 1.5 to two times on the no lizard islands still held true. So in both examples, they're basically adjusting for other possible causes. So let's go back to the answer choices and see what it says. A, concede that observed correlation between spider and lizard populations was weaker than researchers expected. So to concede means to admit. So if you're conceding a point, you're basically saying, hey, you guys who are arguing against me have a point and I'm admitting it. That's not what's going on in the parentheses. The information in the parentheses serves to say that they took into consideration other possible causes and they found that it was not true. So it actually strengthened their results and it didn't make it weaker. So we'll cross off choice A. Choice B, describe additional variables that the researchers took into consideration while investigating the causes of spider population variances. So again, additional variables are additional causes of that relationship. Variances just mean changes in terms of the numbers. And so B is exactly what we were saying. It's most likely the answer, so we'll keep it for now. C, dismiss a possible objection to assumptions the researchers made while recording observations about spider populations. C is a little bit off because while you could talk about, you know, a possible objection being that they didn't take into consideration um, these other things, number one, I wouldn't call it an assumption. And number two, that's really not the purpose. They're not doing it specifically to dismiss a possible objection. They're doing it because they're being good scientists. In other words, when you do statistical studies and you're looking at correlations, you actually have to check all the other variables. So C, uh, not as good as B, we'll cross it off. Choice D, offer an explanation for the unusual nature of the spider population data that the researchers obtained. That would not be an explanation because they're basically saying that the relationship held true despite all those other things that they took into consideration. So that does not serve to be the reason. So D is going to be out and B will be the best answer. So questions 44 and 45 should be done together. Let's look at 44 real quick. It can be reasonably inferred from the passage that the observational studies of the early 1980s were significant in part because they, so significant means why were they important? The observational studies were here, the first one in line 23. It found that spiders were an order of magnitude denser on no lizard islands than lizard islands. So the, the fewer the lizards were, the greater the number of spiders. The second observational study was right here in line 28. It said that the no lizard islands had 1.5 to two times the number of species as had lizard islands. So they're getting the same relationship. In the first study, it's a little bit more extreme than the second study because an order of magnitude denser is about 10 times denser. Here, it's about 1.5 to two times denser. So let's glance real quick at the answer choices, see if we can eliminate any. A, show that certain island ecosystems were more diverse than the researchers previously thought. Those studies had nothing to do with diversity in the ecosystem. It was strictly the relationship between the spiders and the lizards. So we'll cross off A on that account. Choice B, incorporated a new method for studying the effect of land area on species population data. So I did not see anything about a new method, so most likely B is not gonna be the answer. Choice C, were inconsistent with findings of an earlier investigation into a similar relationship. So if you remember, they did compare it to the 1969 study, which showed the opposite relationship. If you didn't remember that, then you'll just have to keep C around for now. Choice D, confirmed the positive correlation researchers had long suspected but not demonstrated. So positive correlation means that as one goes up, the spiders, the lizards also go up. That's not what we just read. We just read that the spiders were higher on the islands where the lizards were lower. So that's actually a negative correlation or an inverse relationship. So D is definitely gonna be out. Most likely our answer is going to be C.
So looking at question 45, it says, which choice provides the best evidence for the answer to the previous question? And remember, most likely the answer is that the two 1980 studies were inconsistent with the findings of an earlier investigation. That's what we're looking for, that they didn't match with something that was done before. Choice A, lines 19 to 22. So we can start at line 19. It says, in 1981, we had to investigate this phenomenon systematically for many small islands in the central Bahamas near the relatively large island of Staniel Cay, a major stopover in our earlier study. So nothing here about the two 1980 studies being inconsistent with the previous one. Here, they're basically just talking about what their plan was. So A is going to be out. Choice B, 23 to 27. And this is the uh, sentence that we pointed out before. This was the result of the first study. The first study found that spiders were an order of magnitude denser on the no lizard than the lizard islands, adjusted for those other variables. So that basically just says the results of the first study. Nothing about it contradicting the results of an earlier study. Choice C, 27 to 33. So this, you'll notice, is the results of the second study. It says, a second observational study in 1982 examined the numbers of spider species, finding that no lizard islands had 1.5 to 2 times the number of species as had lizard islands. So same thing that we talked about before. Nothing here that contradicts an earlier study. Choice D, lines 34 to 38. This result was quite different from Payne's 1966 famous one in the Rocky Intertidal in which diversity increased with increasing predation and it presaged other such results for terrestrial arthropods in our system and in others. The key idea here was diversity increased with increasing predation. So in other words, what that means is that when you've got two animals that eat each other, when you increase that relationship, you get more diversity. So that kind of runs counter to what they found, which was an inverse relationship between spiders and lizards. So all that means is that choice D is the best answer for 45. And that goes along with nicely with choice C as the best answer for 44. So we have another double set of questions. 46 and 47 should be done together. 46 says, based on the passage, the primary advantage the experimental study had over the observational studies was that it could. Let's glance back at the passage real quick just to make sure we know what it's talking about. Now keep in mind, the studies done in 1981 and the ones done in 1982 were the observational studies where they found the inverse relationship between spider populations and lizards. They also referenced the 1966 study, which seemed to contradict that. And then in the next paragraph, they actually talk about the significance of those studies. It says, line 39, such comparative data pointed to a strong negative effect of lizards on spiders, like we said, inversely related, but as true of all comparative studies. So notice they're calling the 1981 and two studies comparative. The observations did not suffice to eliminate alternative hypotheses about why islands with and without lizards might differ. And then it says a more reliable investigation would be experimental. So they're basically just talking about the limitations of the observational studies and the limitations were specifically about the reasons why they differed in population. So let's go back to the answer choices, see if we can eliminate some. Keep in mind, we're looking for an advantage of the experimental study. Uh, choice A says, it could answer a further research question about the effects of human-made structures on spider and lizard interactions. It is true in the experimental study, they did use human-made structures to simulate their three different situations, but that was never a research question. They were never trying to figure out what the effect of human-made structures on spider and lizard interactions was. They were simply using it to set up the, the experiment and the controls. So A is definitely gonna be out. Choice B. It could control for factors that might have influenced the results of the researcher's observational studies. This one seems okay because, again, if you recall how they conducted the experiment, they set up the three sets of the three cages and they were trying to control specifically for certain factors. In other words, lizards being there, lizards not being there, but we'll look at the evidence. Choice C, isolate lizards and spiders from other species to prevent interactions among them from interfering with results. I'd say this is not exactly what they did. The, the way that they set up the experiment was to control the amount of lizard interaction with the spiders. It wasn't so much to isolate them from other species. And if you recall in the passage, they did mention the fact that the fly traps caught a lot more insects. So C, we'll keep it around, but not as good as B so far. 
Choice D, provide a better understanding of diverse ecosystem compositions among individual islands than the observational study could. I'm not really sure if the experiment was or was not doing that. It certainly was not the purpose of the experiment as we just read. So D doesn't really seem likely. We can keep it around. It just sounds kind of off to me. We just read that the purpose of the experiment was to account for other factors. So let's look at the evidence in question 47. Which choice provides the best evidence for the answer to the previous question? And we're going to go through it, lines 39 to 46. Remember, the question is, what is the primary advantage of the experimental study? We've got three candidates. Number one, it can control for other factors. Number two, it can isolate the lizards and spiders from other species. And number three, it can provide a better understanding of diverse ecosystems. So we're looking for an answer that supports any of those. Most likely it's going to be B. Lines 39 to 46. And notice this is exactly what we pointed out before. It says, such comparative data pointed to a strong negative effect of lizards on spiders, but as is true of all comparative study, the observation did not suffice to eliminate alternative hypotheses about why islands with and without lizards might differ. A more reliable investigation would be experimental. And toward that end, we staked out nine approximately 83 square meter plots on Staniel K in 1985. So yeah, this sentence is saying exactly what the purpose of the experimental study was, and specifically it was to eliminate alternative hypotheses as to why the islands differed. So far, A looks good, and that gets paired off with choice B up top. So we'll keep that around now. Choice B, 46 to 50. Three of the plots were unenclosed and the others had wood frame fences made of hardware cloth topped with smooth plastic to impede lizard locomotion in and out. So this is basically just talking about the design of the experiment. Doesn't really mention the fact that this is an advantage. Does it match up with any of these answers? Controlling for factors, isolating the lizards and spiders from other species, or providing a better understanding of diverse ecosystem compositions. Now, obviously the structures that they made the purpose was to impede lizard locomotions, but it wasn't really to isolate lizards and spiders from other species. So really none of these are gonna work. So B is gonna be out. Choice C, lines 50 to 52. It says three of the enclosed plots were randomly chosen to maintain lizards at natural densities, whereas the other three had lizards removed. Pretty much the same idea as B. They're just talking about the setup of the experiment. For the same reasons, it's not really gonna match up with choices B, C, or D. Choice D, lines 52 to 56. Thus, we had three treatments. The two types of enclosed plots tested the lizard effect, and the unenclosed plots were a cage control to be compared with the enclosed lizard plots. I'd say B, C, and D are all kind of the same type of answer. They're explaining the logic and the setup of the experiment. Neither B, C, or D matches up very well with B, C, or D up here. So the best answer is going to be A for 47 and then B for 46. Question 48, as used in line 51, maintain most likely means. So let's look at 51. Start at line 50. It says, three of the enclosed plots were randomly chosen to maintain lizard at natural densities, whereas the other three had lizards removed. Keep in mind that this is one of the three setups that they have. The key here is that this one was enclosed. And what was the purpose? They were chosen to maintain lizards at natural densities which means to prevent lizards from overpopulating or becoming too crowded. So what's a good word? Maybe we want to say keep the lizards there or to hold the lizards at their natural densities. In other words, they want to prevent them from being too many lizards. So we'll keep in mind that our words are going to be keep or hold. And let's see what the choices are. So we got lucky because my guess word was the same as the answer, and I usually do not look at the answer choices before I do my guess words. Choice B, promote. Promote is kind of similar to maintain, but it's a little bit different in the sense that promote usually means to advance or to further something. So it doesn't make sense to say that they're using the enclosed plots to promote lizards at natural densities. They want to keep it the same. So B is out. Maintain can mean defend if you're saying like you're going to maintain a position. Does it make sense to say here that they're defending the lizards at natural densities? Probably not. Choice D, maintain can also mean to declare, such as like to affirm or to assert. In other words, you can maintain that the earth is flat, for example. Here, does it make sense to say that they are declaring the lizards at natural densities? Definitely not. We're not talking about saying 
something. We're talking about actually holding them or keeping them there. So choice D is gonna be out and A is gonna be the best answer. Question 49, which of the following findings, if true, would best support the explanation presented in lines 71 to 74? So I think this is one of the hardest questions in the whole reading section, so let's go through it a little bit more thoroughly. First, what we have to remember is how the experiment was set up. Now keep in mind, we had three types of treatments. One was open, two were enclosed. So I'll say open, closed, closed. One of the closed ones had lizards at natural densities, and one of the closed ones had no lizards. Now, what were the results? Right over here, line 56, it says the 18-month experiment showed that lizard removal enclosures, that's this last one over here, the closed one with no lizards, had spider densities three times higher than those control enclosures and the unenclosed. Now, remember I said there was some confusion in my mind about these, but basically this one down here, three times higher the number of spiders. What else did it have? Higher number of spider species and also numbers and biomasses of insects caught in the sticky traps were also higher. So it also had more insects. And then let's jump to the last paragraph. It says, what was the mechanism of the now firmly established lizard effect on spiders? And keep in mind that effect was no lizards, more spiders. The obvious one is predation. That makes sense because if lizards are eating spiders, take away the lizards, you get more spiders. However, this is what they want us to focus on. A second explanation is competition for food. What does that mean? If lizards and spiders are eating the same prey for food, then obviously taking away lizards is gonna increase the number of spiders because there's no competition for the animals that they're eating. And then they make this side point here. Spiders consume prey large in relation to their own size. So lizards and spiders might overlap in prey size well beyond their relative body sizes alone. Because presumably lizards are a lot bigger than spiders. So initially it might not make sense to you like how do spiders actually eat the same prey as lizards and why would they be in competition? And so really they're just making the point here that spiders eat things that are large in comparison to their own body size. So that's why they eat the same things despite their relative body sizes. So let's go back to the answer choices and see which one makes sense. Now remember, we're looking for something that best supports that explanation. And the explanation is that because of competition for food, there's an inverse relationship between lizards and spiders. That's what you wanna keep in your mind. Choice A, the total insect biomass consumed by spiders was reduced in lizard enclosures and unenclosed plots compared with the biomass consumed by spiders in lizard removal enclosures. So overall, what is this saying? It's saying that the number of insects eaten by spiders was less when there were lizards around. Now, does that make sense if the two of them are in competition? Yes, because if the lizards are present in the lizard enclosures and the unenclosed plots, then they would compete with each other and spiders would end up eating less insects. So that does make sense. So we'll keep that around. Choice B. The survival rate of spiders was significantly higher in the lizard removal enclosures than the lizard enclosures and unenclosed plots. This one is probably also true. In other words, they're basically saying that there were more spiders when there were no lizards around. But keep in mind, that's backing up the first reason for this relationship, predation. That's not backing up the second reason, which is competition for food. Choice B actually has nothing to do with competition for food. This is suggesting that, hey, there are more spiders because they're not getting eaten by the lizards. So B, we're gonna eliminate because it's not answering the question, even though it might be true. Choice C, fewer spider webs were found closer to the ground where lizards might have easier access to them in unenclosed plots and lizard enclosures than in lizard removal enclosures. B and C are kind of saying the same thing. This is basically saying that there are no spider webs where lizards might have access to them because presumably they're eating the spiders. And that's true in the plots where the lizards were present compared to where the lizards were removed. So C is gonna be wrong for the same reason that B is wrong. We're talking about predation in both of these. We're not talking about competition for food. Choice D, insects consumed by spiders in unenclosed plots were significantly larger on average than were insects in lizard enclosures and lizard removal enclosures. This is just a weird answer all around because number one, let's look at what it's saying. It says 
insects consumed by spiders in the open plots where lizards were, you know, walking around presumably, they were larger compared to the other two. But that also doesn't make sense because if the spiders and lizard, lizards were in competition with each other, you would expect in the unenclosed plots for the number of insects consumed by spiders to be smaller, not larger. So I'm going to reject it based on that. And it's also weird that they put the unenclosed plots as having that compared to the plot with the lizard enclosures and the lizard removal enclosures. If anything, to make this more consistent, you would want to say that the unenclosed plots probably had the same results as the lizard enclosures versus the lizard removal enclosures. Either way, for this answer to be supporting the explanation 71 to 74, you'd have to say that the insects consumed in the lizard removal enclosures were larger than the unenclosed and the lizard enclosures. So this answer is kind of off in those two ways. And so all that means is A is going to be our best answer. Question 50, it says, according to figure one, the overall mean population of spiders and plots where lizards were removed was between, and then we're given a range. So let's look at the figure for the first time. So this is figure one. What does it say? Mean number of spiders in three lizard effect treatments, obviously one, two, three. On the y-axis, we have the mean number of spiders. And on the x-axis, we have the times. Remember that this is an 18-month study. What you want to notice is that they actually tell you what the mean was for each of the three situations. So that's probably what we're going to look at for the answer. One thing to notice when you're looking at this chart is in our original schema, when we were outlined in the passage, we said that two of the plots were enclosed. So that would correspond to this one and this one, closed, closed. One of them was unenclosed or open, and of the closed plots, one had no lizards and one had lizards at natural densities. Now keep in mind, the question is asking the mean population of spiders in plots where the lizards were removed. So the lizards being removed, that's this first group, that's this dotted line, and what's the mean population? It's right over here between 75 to 100 and even if they didn't do this for you you can kind of eyeball it it's the mean is going to be somewhere in the middle of this whole line so i would have said the mean is about 100. so looking back at the answer choices we're going to say mean is between 75 and 100 and that's the answer question 51 the information in figure one most strongly suggests that so let's go through the answer choices and we'll check each one with the graph Spiders prey on more insects in the fall than in the spring. So one thing to keep in mind about this graph is they're telling us the population of spiders. They're not telling us how many insects they're eating. Now you may be able to argue that like, hey, if there are more spiders, then that means they're preying on more insects. That might not necessarily be true. Since we're comparing fall and spring, let's look at it real quick. We've got spring right around here and then fall right around here. Then we have spring again over here, and then we have fall again over here. But at this point, this fall, the population seems to be lower than this spring, whereas here, this fall, the population seems to be higher than this spring. So really, I'm not seeing any consistent pattern between fall and spring. Also, we said it's kind of an indirect argument because what we're really looking at is mean number of spiders, not how many insects they eat. So A, probably not going to be the answer. Choice B, spider populations tend to be larger in spring than summer. Notice what's going on from spring to summer. The population generally goes up, maybe takes a little bit of a dip towards the end of the summer. Over here, spring again, we'll say starting somewhere in March to the summer. The population does also seem to go up. That's exactly the opposite of what the answer is saying, that they tend to be larger in spring than summer. If anything, the population seems to be getting larger as we go from spring to summer. So B is going to be out. Choice C, the number of lizards in a given plot varies over time. Keep in mind that this graph is talking about the number of spiders, not the number of lizards. C is going to be out based on that alone. Choice D, the presence of lizards helps to reduce variability in the number of spiders over time. This one's more of an interesting claim. Let's keep in mind that the open plot probably did have lizards walking around. In the enclosed plot, one of them was lizards removed and one of them was lizards kept at natural density. 
So what we're concerned now is not, not what was open or closed, but the two that had lizards, which were these two, which is down here, versus the one that didn't have lizards, which was up here. Now the question is saying that the presence of lizards helps to reduce variability in the number of spiders. That definitely seems to be the case because you'll notice the relative flatness of this curve and these two both had lizards versus the wide variability in this plot where there are no lizards. So because there's much more variability up here with no lizards compared to the two plots with lizards, it does look like choice D is gonna be the best answer. Question 52, which of the following statements does the information in figure two best support? So looking at figure two for the first time, percent composition of anolis lizard diets and adult female M. datona spider diets in lizard effect experiments. First column, we have prey. These are the things that they're eating. Second column, we have the spiders, and it tells us what percent of their diet each of these is. Third column, we have lizards, and it tells us what percent of their diet each of these is. Choice A, the removal of Lepidoptera species would have a large impact on the Anolis lizard diets. Lepidoptera is here, and that only counts for 1.9% of the lizard's diets. So if you remove Lepidoptera, that's not going to have a large effect on their diet. If anything, it's going to have a small effect. So A is going to be out. Choice B, Hemiptera species are much larger than the species M. datona spiders typically prey on. This chart doesn't tell us anything about the size of each of these. I, I'm not really sure what taxonomic order is, but I'm pretty sure it doesn't have anything to do with size. So B, we basically just don't know whether that's true or not. So we'll cross that out. C, in the experiment, anolis lizards were not dependent on any single food source. Yeah, that's actually true because if you're looking at the lizards, they ate all of these guys and there's like, I don't know, 10 of them listed. Choice D, the researchers studied a larger sample size of anolis lizard diets than of M. datona spider diets. So we actually have no idea what the sample size of the diets was. These graphs basically tell us within each of their diets, this is the percent composition. In other words, this is how much they eat of this guy, how much they eat of that guy and that guy. But we don't know the actual size of the sample that they studied to make these conclusions. So choice D is actually gonna be out and the best one is choice C.